As the Friday the 13th films have shown, Jason Voorhees is a nigh unkillable sentinel of teenage virginity, who is most at home punching people's heads off or stomping kidneys. Although the character is supposed to be a merciless killer, most of the actors who've played him seem to have a sense of humour. For example, one of the actors best known for playing Jason Voorhees, Kane Hodder, was well known for the pranks he played on set. So what kind of things would he do? Uh, well, he did quite a lot of stuff really. Most of it involved just freaking people out by the fact he was dressed as Jason. And apparently one of his favourite things to do when they were filming Jason Takes Manhattan was to just stand completely stock still and motionless in full Jason costume while members of the public walk past. And when they got used to him being there and like trying to take photos or like get his attention, he'd very quickly stride towards them and then offer to shake the hand. Uh, another thing he used to do to like freak out his co-stars apparently was he would stride towards them quite menacingly with his hand outstretched like he was going to choke them or something like that and then he'd stop about three feet before he got to them and just start disco dancing. <laughs> just disco dancing and what I want you to do now Brad is do you know the famous clip, the Halloween clip, we all know it, of the guy dancing with the big jack-o'-lantern on his head? Put Jason's head on top of it and put it directly after his sentence. Another actor well known for playing Jason, Ken Kersinger, was also known to run errands during the day in full Jason costume and makeup, sans the character's iconic hockey mask. So what kind of errands did he run in this outfit? Well, one of the most famous stories is that he had a dentist appointment while filming one of the Friday the 13th movies, and rather than take his costume off, he just went in full Jason costume and makeup, obviously not wearing the hockey mask, and walked into the waiting room for his dentist and just sat down. So obviously Kersinger didn't really notice because obviously he'd been wearing the costume for so long he was kind of used to it, yeah. but the people in that dentist office that he went into saw a near seven foot tall man covered in open wounds and bullet holes casually stroll in tell them that he was there for his appointment and sit down and start reading a magazine. I'd like to think it was like Woman's Weekly or something. <laughs> no, it's got to be Cosmo. It's got to be Cosmo because then it, you can see Jason open a magazine that says on the front like 10 ways to drive your man wild in bed. And he's there in full costume. I know he wasn't wearing the mask, but in my head, he's wearing the mask. And just see him nodding along as he reads this article. Like, ah, yes, very interesting. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, maybe he was reading like... Uh, um, uh, like a serial killer's weekly or something like that. <laughs> you just, there's like, like sort of cycles through them. It's like, oh, Cosmo, yeah, interesting. It'd be um, like something out of Airplane where you're going through all the magazines, yeah. or The Simpsons where they look at all the magazines. One's like, oh, serial killer weekly. Because, you know, oh, like top 10 ways to clean your machete. Or the top 10 machete cleaners or something. <laughs> no, it'd be adverts for places where teenagers like to hang out and have sex. Just 10 locations where teens have sex you, you wouldn't believe. Number three will surprise you. It's like, I never thought of killing people in public toilets. Now I know. <laughs> There'll be like ways to do it. You'll be reading through and it's like, interesting, using the top of the cistern as a weapon. That's how he gets all his ideas for his kills. Wow, there's so many ways to murder people. I usually just punch their head off. I didn't know I could tear their spine in half with my bare hands. I'll make a note of that. He's like highlighting them in the he's magazine. He's got a pair of glasses over the mask. <laughs> he's making notes. That's the image that does it for me. Because the magazine just goes down and then you just see like a pair of like big dumb nerd specs over the mask. He's like, hmm, yes, yes. Um, like the version of Jason from Family Guy, where he's like the really well-spoken guy who owns a business. And he's talking about, oh, they reopened the lake. He's like, oh, it's really nice to see local wildlife returning. And just turns around, stabs three teenagers and goes back. And... <laughs> And if you look around, I think even the wildlife is starting to come back. So I think that's one of my favourite running jokes in Family Guy. And it's where the girl says, oh, I can't really give you a discount, because if I do, my boss says he'll kill me. And it's Jason Voorhees from early comes in and goes, ah, how's everything going, Carol? How's everything going out here? Fine, Mr. Voorhees. Good, because if you screw up, I'll kill you. Oh, my God. Um, so as you can imagine, people in that waiting room were kind of worried. Yeah. They didn't think uh, Kersing was a serial killer, apparently. They just thought he was really injured and was, like, dazed and confused. Because obviously he walked in quite casual as anything and just sat down. So he thought, oh, man, maybe he's been in an accident and he just doesn't know where he is. And he had to say, no, I'm an actor, and this is makeup, and it just takes a really long time to take off. Now, although the character of Jason is kind of silly, most of the actors who've portrayed him have taken the role very seriously. None more so than actor Derek Mears, who portrayed Jason in the 2009 reboot. So 
how does he take it so seriously? Uh, well, in this reboot, they reimagine the character of Jason Voorhees as being like a crazy wild man who'd been abandoned in the woods from childhood. So Mia studied child psychology, wilderness survival, and basic hunting to uh, get into the mindset of what it would be like to be a child who was abandoned and then had to survive in the wilderness on their own for many years. I always find it interesting how some actors will take characters to the next level, even though the audience probably wouldn't notice. Especially for a character like Jason Voorhees. Yeah. Well, I know he's an iconic character from cinema history, but you don't really expect people to think, yeah, the guy who's playing him in this spent weeks studying child psychology because the background is that he was abandoned as a child. Most of the actors who were hired to play him were hired based on the fact they were quite tall. That's literally the only reason they were hired. And Derek Mays is like, no, I'm really going like, to get into the the core of this character. In my head, Mears was always sort of just off stage in full Jason costume, like asking the director, so what am I feeling in this scene? And the director's just like, that you want to kill the person. Okay, but why do I want to kill the person? Because you're Jason Voorhees, and it's a Friday the 13th movie. Yes, but what's my motivation? Now having sex and you don't like it, but why don't I like it? He is quite a two-dimensional character, isn't he? He just kind of walks around and stabs people. Well, he was originally, yeah, but well, I guess they were trying to add more nuance to him. We did the same with uh, Mike Myers. They've Michael tried, Myers yeah, the in the horrible Rob Zombie remake movie. Well, the reason that movie's terrible is because they have a scene in it where they say, oh yeah, as a child, Michael Myers was just evil. Behind these eyes, one finds only blackness. And Joe says this, a child psychologist. It's like, fucking great work, mate. Yeah, like I gave up. And what he basically says, I gave up trying to help this child because he was just evil. Because excellent work there, Mr. Child Psychologist. The kid was just evil, so fuck it. <laughs> You've earned your degree. <laughs> Why not, eh? I don't think they should try and remake these characters because they never really had any depth anyway. That, that, that was the whole point of the slasher films, is that you're followed by this this ambiguous evil. Yeah, the more that you explain something scary, the less scary it becomes. So Derek Mays is, by all accounts, a super nice guy. And a lot of actors who work with him might express doubts that he couldn't convincingly play this terrifying super murderer. And that really annoyed him because people say, oh, how are you going to switch from Derek mode to Jason mode? You're so nice. And do you know what he'd say in response to that? What? Well, it's called acting. It's kind of what I do and then walk off. And I quite like the idea of a guy who played Jason Voorhees <laughs> lecturing people on the nuances of acting <laughs> in a movie where his only real um, uh, direction was punch this person's head off. So like other actors who play Jason, Mears was always keen to play jokes on the cast and crew in full Jason costume. What kind of things did he do? Uh, one of his favourites apparently was to switch from Jason mode to Derek mode, like that. So what he'd do is he'd be like thrashing around on set and throwing actors across the room until the instant he heard the word cut, at which point he becomes super apologetic and polite. And like, oh, oh my God, are you okay? I'm really, really sorry. Can I help you up in full Jason costume to like lighten the mood? <laughs> so imagine for a second being the actor in that scene and you're stood next to this big giant man and you're told, right, for this scene, this big giant dude's going to pretend to throttle you to death. Isn't that right, Derek? And he doesn't say anything because he's in character. It's like, oh, well, Derek agrees. Are you ready? I, I, I guess so. And as soon as the scene starts, this giant man starts trying to pretend murder you. And the second you hear the word cut, like all the lights come on and you immediately like, oh, so can I help you up, mate? You all right? Come on, let's get a drink. He's like, oh, okay, oh God, you're okay. Oh God, oh God, I've messed up your shirt there, like doing the lapels I'll and grab your drink. I'll grab your drink from the water cooler. You just stay here, you'll be okay. So you relax, you relax. You've had a hard day, you've had a hard day. I'll get you a drink, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Can I help anybody? Anyone like a drink? Anyone like a drink? Action! <laughs> 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 So the, uh, the machete's materialised in his hand and he just starts sprinting across set with it. You don't gain the powers of Voorhees when you become Voorhees. Derek Mears could. What else did he do? When they were filming the 2009 reboot, the director found out that some Boy Scouts were camping nearby. And he approached me and said, do you know what would be really funny? If you walked over to their camp in full Jason costume and introduced yourself, and Mears said, that is quite funny, but I've got a better idea. How about if we waited for one of the Boy Scouts to be on their own, and then I went over in full Jason costume and introduced myself to him. And it was only when someone pointed out, do you think maybe walking over to a kid on his own dressed as a fictional murderer might be a bad idea? And me is like, 
Yeah, hang on, that probably is a bad idea. I could get shot if I did that. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. And I'm thinking in my head, if they did do that, what was their end goal? That's not a prank. That's just terrifying a small child and potentially scarring them for life. If you'd have done something like this to like, a member of the cast or the crew and like hid in a closet or something and jumped out in full Jason costume, that's quite funny. Walking over to a kid in the woods on their own, dressed as a murderer, as a seven foot tall man and just going, sup. That kid is not going to think that's funny, even if you try and explain it to him. And do you know what the thing was as well? well? They were going to deny that they did it. <laughs> so this poor kid was going to run back. Their plan was to scar this poor kid. And when he run back to tell, I've just seen a guy in the woods in a hockey mask with a machete. And it's like, well, are they filming something nearby? Maybe it was the actors, one of them. Oh, is one of your actors uh, wearing a hockey mask in this film? No. You're lying, Billy. What did you really do? <laughs> that poor kid. Do you know my favourite part about that is as well? Like, this was a reboot and these were Boy Scouts, so chances are none of them would even know who the fuck Jason Voorhees is. So it's not really a prank. Like, if you'd have done it to an adult, that's a prank because obviously a lot of adults have, like, through pop culture osmosis, know who Jason Voorhees is. Kids don't. All a kid would have seen is a scary big man in a scary mask with a big knife. <laughs> that's not a prank, that's just being mean to a kid. I would argue it's not really a decent prank for an adult either. If you were in the woods on your own and a seven foot tall blood covered man approached, even if he was dressed as a serial killer. In fact, he's dressed as a serial killer that you're aware of. <laughs> yeah. and he's carrying a machete. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a watershed moment for film, mainly because of all the ultra realistic hyper violence shown on screen. As it turns out, most of this was real, largely because the actor playing Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen, couldn't be arsed in most of his scenes. All right, let's just get the ball rolling Okay. Then. Pick a scene. We'll start with that scene in which the character of Sally has her finger sliced open and an old ass man begins sucking on her sweet teenage blood for nourishment. You know, this scene. So what in that scene was real? All of it. How was all of it real? All of it was real. The blood, the cutting of the finger, the screaming, the old ass man sucking on the blood. It was all real. It wasn't supposed to be, I should point out, but it was. So was the knife real? The knife was real, but it was dulled with tape, which was placed over the blade, so that Gunnar Hansen, aka Leatherface, could run it along the actress's finger without hurting her, at which point people off camera would begin pumping the fake blood through, and it, it might start spurting out of her fingertip, like giving the effect that he cut her finger open. The problem was though that, you know, it gets hot when you're filming under like lights, as I can assure people. Now I've got two of them shining in my face and the fake blood in the tubes coagulated and every time they tried to do a take of that scene, the blood wouldn't pump through the pipes. So how did they manage to solve the issue of the coagulated blood? They didn't. And Gunnar Hansen was getting kind of pissed off with it because he was stood there in full leather face makeup under hot lights, sweating his nads off. So what he did is, after one failed take too many, he quietly took the tape off the knife and then stood there patiently waiting for like, to hear the word action again in full leather face makeup, staring at the actress. So not that I need to ask, but what happened next? The moment the director yelled action, Gunnar went into Leatherface mode, grabbed the actress and roughly cut the end of her fingertip open. And the thing is, after you cut someone's finger open, like, they're not going to want to do that scene again. So, because that was the only usable take they had, that's the one that made it into the film. So that actress screaming is genuine because you can't fake that kind of terror. And the old guy, did he drink the real blood then? I think he did. Because obviously, as like I said, the fake blood wouldn't pump through the pipes. To be honest, I'm not surprised they used that take in the film. Oh, neither am I, because in Hollywood, they do that shit all the time, don't they? Like, oh, actor or stunt, the guy gets injured trying to do a stunt. Wow, that take looks really awesome. Let's use that in the final movie. Let's let the failure live on forever. Just before we move on, I just want to double check something. Okay. Did Gunnar ask permission from anybody? Oh, no, because he'd have asked permission, they'd have said no. Speaking of that scene, it's probably worth noting that in addition to the knife being real, the hammer wielded by the aforementioned old ass man when he's trying to cave in somebody's head while they put it over a bucket was also real. And the actor playing that old ass man was genuinely at risk of caving that person's head in if he'd have missed. I don't want to be on that film set. 
don't think anyone did really. <laughs> Madman wandering around with sharp and knives yeah. and a well, hammer. Apparently it really smelled. Mm. Just the set, it stunk. For, like, for reasons we'll get to in a moment, but yeah, it really stunk. It was boiling up, and especially like, for the guy playing Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen, he says, oh, that costume was awful. Because I had to wear like, this stupid mask and carry around like a 40 pound actual real chainsaw. So, oh yeah, the chainsaw in Texas Chainsaw Massacre was also real. Doesn't he like hold it really close to people's faces and threaten everyone with it? Yes, he does. Like in this shot here. <laughs> so yeah, that's a real working chainsaw next to a real working actor's head who was not paid nearly enough money to appear in that movie, given that he could have had his head fucking cut off at any moment if Gunnar would have sneezed or went to scratch his balls. But apparently the risk to everyone in that scene was fairly minimal. The same cannot be said of scenes where Gunnar had to run around holding the chainsaw. Let's just take a little step back. Okay. Who tries to scratch their balls holding a chainsaw, Carl? I don't know. Guys who are confident in their ability to wield a chainsaw, I suppose. Very, very specific group yeah. of people. Well, it's like the old question is, it's like, um, like, how do you scratch your balls holding a chainsaw? Like, carefully. Or my personal favourite Yahoo Answers like thing ever, which is, uh, what's the word for fear of chainsaws? And the top answer is just the word common sense. <laughs> so all of the chase scenes they do in the movie, yes. they're also real. Yes, they are also real. And just so we're all on the same page here, one of those scenes called for Gunnar to chase someone through a field wearing a vision obscuring mask, wearing high heel boots while carrying an actual working chainsaw at night. That's like going in a video game, put it on like the, the highest difficulty <laughs> It set. is, isn't it? It's like, you've already got the, the added difficulty wearing like the vision obscuring mask, and then you're wearing the high heel boots, and then like, you know, the movement restricting costumes. You've got to wear like a fucking smock, and then you've got all the other shit he's got to do. Like you're running through a field, there can be anything that could trip you up. Then you've got to chase somebody, then you've got to scream while you're doing it. <laughs> and and it's pitch black. And then it's night. It's, yeah. it's night time, because fuck you. Just like sl difficulty slider all the way up. It's like fuck you difficulty. According to the actor, the most difficult part of filming those scenes is the fact that the actress he was chasing didn't run fast enough. What do you mean she didn't run fast enough? Well, according to Gunnar Hansen in a later interview, he recalled that I... The actress ran so slowly that he actively had to limit how fast he ran while holding the chainsaw. So the only reason that Leatherface doesn't like, you know, rage sprint at cheetah speed towards the actress and cut her into confetti is because Gunnar Hansen's like, nah, I'm all right. But we're not done talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre just yet. Because in addition to the knives, the chainsaw and the blood all being real, pretty much everything else on set was too. So all of the gory stuff and the bones, they were all real as well? Oh yeah, all those bones are real. Show some real ass skeletons, folks. There were skeletons in that movie. As in animal skeletons? Oh no, real human skeletons. Do you know why? This is, this is the best thing. Because it was cheaper to buy skeletons wholesale from India than it was to buy fake plastic ones. And you might be thinking, Carl, that's awful. But I'd like to look at it a different way and hope that somewhere out there, there is the ghost of some random Indian dude who just gets mad hype thinking about the fact that his skeleton got turned into that sick, awesome bone lamp in the movie. That has genuinely got to be one of the worst facts I've heard so far. What? That it's cheaper to buy real human remains than it is to just make fake plastic bones. Did you, did you not know about the Hollywood skeleton trade? There's not a Hollywood skeleton. No, I'm making that bit up now. But in the 80s, um, there was a big trend of them um, just buying like, you know, skeletons en masse for horror movies because it was cheaper just to buy them, like I said, wholesale from like, foreign countries where they didn't give a shit and just import them because making fake plastic bones and then ageing them realistically took an age. Do you know, do you know what's cheaper and easier? Buy a real one. And do you know what makes it even worse? that most of the time they didn't tell the actors they were using real skeletons because they didn't want them to get scared because skeletons are scary folks. And um, the famous example of that is Poltergeist, right at the end of the movie where the lady falls into like, you know, the pit of skeletons and like all the skeletons rise to the surface out of the water and she shits herself. She asked like the director after that, so, wow, those skeletons look like, you know, really real. 
how'd you do that? And went, oh no, they are real skeletons. So the skeletons are real, the yep. cutting the fingers real, the yep. chainsaw's real. And don't forget the fear. The fear was also real. Okay, so I'm going to just hazard a guess that the blood was all real as well. Oh yes, the blood was all... It wasn't human blood, I should point out. Like, oh, oh no, was no, it not cheaper to buy human blood? No, it was cheaper to buy animal blood right, from slaughterhouses. So what they did is they bought like you know animal carcasses and blood and stuff from slaughterhouses and just threw it all over the sets and then dressed the sets with like you know the gore and viscera they obtained from the slaughterhouses. And remember earlier when I said it was really hot on the set and that it really smelled bad? Now you know why. Because there was like, you know, decaying animal carcasses all over the set. I should point out as well, like Joe, when they couldn't afford to buy, you know, like carcasses from slaughterhouses, do you know where they sourced some of like, you know, the corpses of animals? Side of the road. Oh. So they weren't filming in Texas after all. So they just went out for roadkill, scraped it up with a shovel and just chucked it on set. Yeah, remember when I said this movie smelled? It really smelled. By Gunnar Hansen's own estimation, there were only 10 fake bones in the entirety of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. And that might sound like a lot of fake bones, until you realise there were a lot of bones in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Given that they only had 10 fake bones to work with, the rest of the sets were dressed with, as noted, actual human remains, carcasses of animals, sourced from slaughterhouses, and dead dogs found by the side of the road. Now we don't know for sure whether the director went out in his car and ran those dogs over himself, but Given what we've talked about today, I wouldn't be surprised if I found out that he did. Since we've talked about Leatherface today, Brad, let's settle the argument once and for all, at least between us. Leatherface, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers. Who's your man? Who's going to win in a four-man battle royale? In an actual fight? Yeah, in an actual fight to the death. Because obviously they tried to do that in Freddy vs. Jason, but neither one lost because they couldn't do it because the respective rights holders of each movie wouldn't let them lose. So let's just say... Fuck those guys who actually make them fight for real. Who's going to win? I think a genuine fight between the four of them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, because Kruger's the only one who's genuinely supernatural, isn't it? No, Jason's supernatural. Don't forget, Jason went to space. So I, I, my money's always going to be on Jason. I think my money would be on Jason. Out of the four, my favourite is probably Michael Myers. I, I really like the... I quite enjoyed the Rob Zombie one. Like, I know it, it's not like... A it's not opinion, great, yeah. But... I like Michael Myers of the idea that it's probably the cheapest, laziest costume in any horror movie ever. And it's scary. If people don't know, like, the actual mask they used in the first Halloween movie was a, it's a William Shatner Star Trek mask spray painted white. That's literally it. And then they give the guy a boiler suit and a knife. Mm. And that's it. And that's it. And that's his costume. That's it. That... <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. Because of course, like a, an eight foot version of fucking William Shatner who's ghostly white would be terrifying. Getting back to the topic, Brad, we've established that Leatherface and Michael Myers have their shit rocked. But let's say you start introducing like, you know, other slasher movie icons from the 80s. How would Chucky fare? Like if Chucky came in as a ringer? I think Chucky would suck. No, but can't Chucky transfer his soul? Like he transfers it into the doll, doesn't he? What would happen if Chucky transferred his soul into Leatherface's chainsaw? Because then you've got an evil chainsaw. Yeah, but the evil <gasps> chainsaw can't really do no. much on its own. But what about if, like, you know, because Leatherface is a human and he understands machinery, because you see him tinker around with his chainsaw and shit, <laughs> he teamed up with all of the evil inanimate objects from movies, like Christine the car, you get, and then you get put on the car, he puts the tyres from rubber, the evil sentient tyres that run people over, and he puts them on Christine, and then he's got his chainsaw with Chucky's soul in it. What other, what other inanimate objects have you got from movies? There's that one where it's the elevator, the evil, no, the evil elevator How that kills people. How are you people. incorporating an evil elevator into this fight scene? No, he does the thing from Fast and the Furious, where he straps the safe onto the back of the car, but it's the elevator. And he straps on the back of the car and he does like sick tail whip spins and it slaps people with the safe. The I evil think elevator. if you have to get to and this... And it does, it chomps and it grabs him inside and kills him. If you have to keep adding this much stuff to make it an even fight, he's not going to make it an even fight. I'm making it a curb stomp symphony. What other inanimate objects that are in horror movies can like, they wield? Because that can be like, you know, their, um, uh, the mystical artifacts they get. What about all of the items from Goosebumps? Oh. Like the blood. Slappy. They get slappy. And then they get monster. Oh my god, they could do this. And what, like, what you do is you make it like the Hunger Games. If you're going to do that, you have to add in more people to fight. So you put in like a bunch of different horror villains and then horror items are available for them to use. Oh man, that'd be fucking amazing. We've got an idea here. Eh? Hollywood, if you're watching... <laughs> fuck make, Freddy vs. Jason. Fuck Freddy vs. Jason. How about everybody versus everybody fucking else with like all the other shit, man? 
Because there were so many like random cursed objects from horror movies that you could bring in. Mm. And they could all wield them like, you know, like weapons. I want to see like an RPG. Like, I want, I, yeah, I want to level up my leather face. <laughs> oh, he's, like, he's not wielding a chainsaw anymore. He's wielding like the fucking Pandora's box or some shit like that. He's wielding like the gem from Wishmaster. And he's <laughs> fucking sick, man. This is, what a good idea for a film. With the internet currently losing its shit about the upcoming holiday of Halloween, as it is wont to do, we thought we'd take a minute to talk about how the guy who played Pinhead in the Hellraiser movie was really good at applying his own makeup. I know this is going to hurt. Okay. But there will be people out there, younger viewers, who may not know who Pinhead is. Yeah, that's a depressing thought, but for those people who don't know who Pinhead is, because, like, you know, you're too young, or you're not cool enough to have watched those movies, Pinhead is a horror movie icon from the 1980s, and I think the 90s only had a few movies there, who stands alongside the likes of Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, and Freddy Krueger. You know, one of those, like, iconic villains who fuck people's shit up in increasingly shitty movies. I am the way. Why is it horror of all genres that gets the most sequels to its movies? Because my working theory is that they're so cheap to make and that people who watch them don't really expect much from them. You just want to see like teenagers getting their shit rocked and a guy with a big knife and a boiler suit walking around. Well, every review I now see of any new Saw movie says, if you're a fan of Saw, you'll like the movie. And it's like, well, you know they're literally there to watch people get ripped apart. Yeah, and they cost so little to make. Oh, you don't have to hire any big name actors, because why would you? They're going to get killed. So you just hire some no-name actor who'll work for scale and think of a way to kill them. That's as gruesome as possible. Put in a few shitty jump scares, bish bash bosh, job done. $40 million at the box office on a $5 million budget. Okay, so I think we're beating a dead horse by saying there are horror movies that have had too many sequels made to them. But, here's the inverse. What horror movie hasn't had enough sequels made? Because my money's on Final Destination. Because I would watch a Final Destination movie every day of the fucking week. If they released a new one of those every three months, I'd go watch it. Because those things are always amazing. It would be amazing if they kept trying to trip up the audience. They bring back Sean William Scott. <laughs> Was he in one of those things? the first one. Oh my god, that's He's the guy who gets his head knocked off by a train. That's great, put the clip in. You're dead! You're dead! And now put a clip in of, like, Stifler. Well, polish my nuts and serve me a milkshake. Moving back to Pinhead, although he does share many similarities with the characters we've just talked about, he stands out as a fairly unique example of a horror movie icon. So why is that? Well, unlike Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees, Pinhead isn't a mindless killing machine, and unlike Freddy Krueger, he's not a child molesting maniac. Yeah, they kind of walked that back in the later movies, didn't they? The whole thing about Freddy Krueger being a, a big old child molester, big old kiddie fiddler. So how is Pinhead different from those other slasher icons? Well, unlike Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Leatherface, he's portrayed as being articulate and well-spoken, more akin to Hannibal Lecter or Dracula. Tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. The decision to make Pinhead a well-spoken and articulate villain was a deliberate one on behalf of the movie's creator who felt that a smart villain was infinitely more scary than a dumb one. So why did he say that a smart villain is scarier than a dumb one? Because a smart villain knows that they're hurting you and they just don't care. That's why, like, you know, Dr. Hannibal Lecter is so terrifying because he's smart enough to know that he's doing wrong but he does it anyway, as opposed to someone like Leatherface, who's got like, the mind of a child, and he's just doing as he's told. Like, you can kind of feel sympathy for that villain, because it's like, oh, he's a product of like, you know, his upbringing or some shit like that. You can't say that with Dr. Hannibal Lecter or someone like Pinhead. They've got, like, they've got the intelligence to know what they're doing is like, you know, morally wrong. They just don't give a fuck. And that somehow, that's even scary. It's like when it hurts more to get kicked in the nuts intentionally by another man than it does when someone throws a remote control across the room and, ha and accidentally dings you in the nuts. It's like, the knowing makes it hurt more. This all said, Pinhead does share at least one similarity with the character of Freddy Krueger, in that they've both been consistently portrayed by the same actors on screen, Doug Bradley and Robert Ingram, respectively. How many Hellraiser movies actually are there? There are 10. Wow. Yeah. And there was one released as recently as 2018, in February of this year, I believe. Because, of course, why would you not release a horror movie in February? You know, the spookiest month. That's how, that's how bad it is. And understandably, Doug Bradley is not in that movie, and he's not in the one before that, which I believe was made in about three weeks because they were going to lose the rights to the Hellraiser name, which is always a good sign. And they asked Doug Bradley to be in it, and he went, nah. Fuck it, I don't want to be in this one, it looks like shit. 
So that was already a bad sign. If he'd appeared in the first eight and you can't convince him to appear in like, you know, the ninth one, someone's already a miss. And it was so bad that the original creator, Clive Barker, went, yeah, this movie sucks. And when they put his name on the poster saying, from the mind of Clive Barker, because obviously it's inspired by his universe, he went, it's not from my mind, it's not even from my arsehole on Twitter. <laughs> and then the 10th one, they asked Doug Bradley again, come back, play Pinhead, and he went, no. Because he said, I want to read the script because the last Hellraiser movie sucks all kinds of balls. I don't want to get burned to be in another shit movie. Bear in mind he was in Hellraiser 8. They wouldn't let him do it without signing NDA. So he said, no, fuck it, I'm not being in this movie. So he didn't appear in 9 or 10? No, but both of those movies are shit, so I don't think they'd count. Although I'm a bit disappointed that he didn't appear in them in some capacity. He said he'd have like, you know, a 10 movie streak playing Pinhead. And if he appeared in just one Hellraiser movie, he could have got himself an AC-130. <laughs> That's a joke for all the Modern Warfare 2 fans out there who I know are watching this video. Oh, then, man. then again, if he had Hardline, he could have done it in the 10. Oh, he could have done it in 10, couldn't he? Thing is, though, what, you know, perk setup in Modern Warfare 2 would Pinhead use? Because I think we all know, like, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface would all use Commando Pro because they're all melee weapon users, aren't they? It'd also make, that'd make them so much because the amount, the <laughs> distance you'd cover with Commando. How <laughs> deadly Michael Myers, <laughs> Freddy Krueger, no, no, Freddy Krueger, does he stab people? Um, he'd probably, he'd he does probably, various no, he'd probably use Ninja and like Scrambler and that shit, wouldn't he? <laughs> no, and then, but the thing is, Pinhead though, he'd have one-man army and Danger Close. He'd be that dickhead with a noob tube firing it across the map because he's got like all the Cenobites on his team, hasn't he? He's that dickhead. He'd be the guy who's in like the MLG clan who plays like all the other like top-level people because he'd have all his Cenobites on his team. <laughs> and then he's got the team of Michael Myers, the Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees and Leatherface all running around like dickheads with Commando Pro on, <laughs> just jumping off buildings, doing 360s and just doing 40-foot knife stabs. Getting back to Pinhead, understandably after appearing in eight of these fucking movies, Doug Bradley got kinda good at applying the iconic Pinhead makeup. Surely they would have had some makeup artists to do it for him. But to apply the Pinhead makeup? Yeah, they did in the first couple of movies, but they replaced the makeup artists between films. They didn't replace Doug Bradley. And because Doug Bradley knew how the makeup was applied, he eventually got so good at helping them apply it, he got a makeup artist credit in the third and fourth movie. Because he said, fuck it, I can do it myself, it's quicker if I do it. Because obviously he sat in that chair and had it put on so many times before, whereas like the makeup artists they brought on for those movies were doing it for the first time. It's like, oh, don't worry, you can sit there and collect a paycheck. Just go put some more pop powder on that person's nose. I'm going to put these fucking needles into my eyeballs. Out of curiosity, why is he covered in pins? Well, the comics go into it in a bit more detail, but from my surface level understanding of the Pinhead cinematic universe, it's uh, something to do with the fact that Pinhead and all the Cenobites worship some weird religion where pain is seen as like the ultimate form of expression or pleasure or some shit like that. So they all exist in a like perpetual state of agony. Which is why all the Cenobites are like basically walking in like torture gear all the time. And it's why all the people in the Hellraiser movies get really fucked up. <laughs> because oh my, do people get fucked up in these movies. While we're talking about the makeup of Pinhead, fun fact, that makeup obscured Doug Bradley's actual real face so much that when he turned up to the premiere of the first Hellraiser movie, he got really despondent and upset when nobody there would talk to him, despite the fact he'd been working with them for months. And it wasn't until he pointed out like, yeah, I'm, I'm Pinhead. I'm the main character in this movie. He went, oh shit, sorry, I've not seen you without your makeup on. <laughs> and, and he went, oh, is that why everyone's been an arsehole to me and no one knows who the fuck I am? And they're like, yeah, kinda. And he's like, oh, that kind of makes sense. I thought people were just being dicks. So if you decide to cuddle up with someone this Halloween and watch some old horror movies, if you decide to watch the third and fourth Hellraiser movies, it may amuse you to know that before Pinhead filmed many of his scenes, he probably spent an hour doing that annoying mascara face in the mirror while applying his makeup. You'd think, given that the character of Michael Myers literally never says a word and spends every second of his screen time wearing a mask it's impossible to emote through, portraying the character would be a piece of piss. Well, that's not exactly the case according to the guys who played him. Or at least most of them. So, to start with, some people might not know who Michael Myers is. Yeah, he's a, he's a slasher movie villain. An icon, if you will, from the 1980s. But the, the canon of the Halloween movies is arguably one of the most confusing of any series. Because I believe... I, we're going to need a fact bar to break this one down because even me, as like a fan of this series, doesn't quite know what the canon is because there are multiple timelines um, that contradict and intersect with each other at varying points. Like, I think 
Halloween 1, and 1 to 3 are all canon, but then 4 is a new start to the trilogy, but then they disregard it. And then there's a movie where one character catches on fire and explodes, but then he's back in another movie with just like a single scar on his face. And then there's Halloween H2O, which is Halloween 20 years later, which is a direct sequel to the first movie. But then you've got a Rob Zombie reboot. But then you have another, another reboot that was actually a direct sequel to the first one again, starring Jamie Lee Curtis. It's a mess. Uh, it's one of those movies where they didn't expect it to be as big as it was, so they kept making sequels to it, and then the timeline got all convoluted. But well, the main takeaway I'd like the audience at home to have is that you're not really supposed to know what Michael Myers is or what he's capable of, at least according to the guy who created the character, John Carpenter. So, Carl, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is it's actually something me and you have discussed on the channel several times before, because we've talked about how um, horror movies are always scarier when the threat is something that you don't quite understand or are made fully aware of. Because mystery is always scarier than things that you know, right? Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a fairly simple concept. Humans naturally fear the unknown. And John Carpenter, being an absolute master of his craft, completely understands this concept. And as a result, um, in all the movies he had a hand in featuring Michael Myers, uh, the, the character's backstory is never explained. His motivations are largely unknown to us, the audience. And even like, if he's human, is left up to our own interpretation, which just makes him scarier. Because, yeah, he's just a, he's a literal faceless killing machine that can't be stopped. That's a terrifying concept. And it's also something that that shitty Rob Zombie reboot I mentioned completely threw out of the window, much to the annoyance of John Carpenter. I've not seen the Rob Zombie version of that film, Good. so why do you hate it so much? It's because, like I said, like, John Carpenter, like, he knows this concept that me and you have talked about. Like, like, mystery is scarier. Humans fear the unknown. The Rob Zombie movie, they give Michael Myers a backstory, and they even have a line where an actor just goes, he's just a really, really evil man who likes stabbing people and it completely removes any tension and any mystery about the character. It's like, oh, Okay then, and John Carpenter himself has gone on record as saying fuck Rob Zombie. <laughs> it seems like a really lazy backstory as well, like, oh, he just likes killing people. Okay. He's just evil, cool. yeah, he's just wrong in the head. It's so bad, there's a great story of John Carpenter where um, Rob Zombie, in the lead up to release of his movie, talked about how John Carpenter was very cold towards him and very mean, he's like, oh, he doesn't like my take on the character. Um, uh, and like to you know, drum up support and controversy about the movie. And John Carpenter, uh, like, you know, being a nice guy, didn't say anything about it until a couple of years later when he was asked. And he went, look, I was nothing but nice to Rob Zombie. I told him, look, you make the movie you want to make. And then he started spreading shit about me being a dick to him. I don't know why he did that or why he was such an asshole about it. All I'll say though is that, is that his version of Michael Myers sucks ass. <laughs> Because he doesn't understand the character. It's like, yeah, you go, John Carpenter. In regards to playing the character Michael Myers... Yes. Some of the actors who played him found it quite difficult. Yeah, and they treat it very seriously because Michael Myers is a horror movie icon at this point. So when you get the chance to don that famous white mask, which, yes, I know people scream out in the comments, is a William Shatner Star Trek mask spray-painted white. Everybody knows that fact about Halloween. Let's move on. Um, they take it very seriously because obviously there's a lot of gravitas to this role and a thought process that's made all the more hilarious when you realise that the first guy to play Michael Myers, like the original actor, to like, you know, bring that character to life, um, didn't know what the fuck he was doing. It was an actor called Nick Castle who was hired literally because John Carpenter thought he had a funny way of walking that was quite interesting and would translate well to the screen. And according to Castle, um, Carpenter walked him through every scene beforehand and all he did is just exactly what Carpenter told him to do, which was usually from walk from point A to point B with his apparently very interesting walk. And that was the extent of his role. It's like, stand here, walk there, I will film it, I'm John Carpenter, I'll make it look good. Like, that's kind of gotten lost in the source. As I said, over the years, Michael Myers, like, he's become this mythical figure in film history, and actors who play him take the role very seriously. For example, when it came to Halloween 5, the actor doing that was all kinds of serious about how he wanted to play Michael Myers. Okay, so how serious did the actor who played him in Halloween 5 take this role? 
uh, very seriously to the point where uh, the directors were giving him like really vague artistic sounding directions that he didn't quite understand. For example, during his initial audition to play Michael Myers, um, like he put the mask on and he walks and the director stopped him. Look, um, when you play Michael Myers, you can't just walk from point A to point B. You have to move like wood through water. And uh, the actor Don Shanks, I, I didn't know what I thought that meant. So I walked like my back hurt and then got the roll. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I think's okay. Oh, oh God! No! And as a reminder as well, like Halloween 5 is not a great movie, but we need to point out what Michael Myers looked like in it, because Nisha, you've got the article in front of you, right? Yeah. Do you just want to scroll down and have a quick look at what Michael Myers looked like in Halloween 5? Oh, is it the one... Is it the just, one of just his face with the, the with dagger? With the knife. With the yeah. knife. Yeah, how shit does that oh look? God, it's terrible. But well, they were treating it like Shakespeare. It's like, you have to move like wood moves through water. And he's like, I don't know what the fuck that means. So he just walked like he's got a stiff back. He's like, that works. I'm honestly surprised the director didn't tell him to move with the swiftness of a coursing river with all the strength of the great typhoon while also having the mysteriousness of the dark side of the moon. Because the fuck does move like wood through water mean? You forgot strength of the raging fire. Ah, oh, god damn it! And there we go, fake fucking Disney fan confirmed, boo. I'm guessing other actors have taken this role way too seriously. Um, other actors who've played Michael Myers over the years have reportedly studied everything from the like mannerisms of serial killers to the movements of tigers in documentaries to inform their own movements when in costume. <laughs> but there's just something really amusing to me about the idea of these guys who their role is put on this boiler suit and this white mask and chase around a, like, a skinny white girl with a knife. I'm like, yeah, but I must study the movements of the tiger to perfectly emulate the movements of like this, this killer. I've just had a really funny image. You know how cats do that butt wiggle when they're about to pounce on something? Oh, the butt wiggle, yeah. I'm just imagining, like, someone dressed as Michael Myers hiding behind a bush and then starts doing the butt wiggle. <laughs> just doing a little butt wiggle. But then the whole thing comes full circle because for the 2018 um, soft reboot slash sequel slash who gives a fuck, uh, they actually brought back Castle. Um, to play Michael Myers for some of the scenes. Um, like not the action oriented ones, but the ones where like, you know, Michael Myers is walking around and stalking Jamie Lee Curtis. So why is this funny? Well, it's because um, they got stunt actors in to play Michael Myers for the action scenes. And these stunt actors wanted to do the role of Michael Myers justice. And as a result, um, badgered Castle endlessly about how to play the character and would be on set when he was doing his cameo, observing his movements and would study the dailies of him walking around. And he was just, endlessly amused by this because like I, I don't know what i did i literally just walked from a to b and tried to stab jamie lee curtis with a knife i didn't do anything special but like the actors kept badging like but how like, what do you think about when you put the mask on it's like i don't think about anything i just walk from a to b and it's just <laughs> he's probably <laughs> just thinking like hey but don't trip up and a quote from castle is all I do is put on a mask and walk, and people don't stop asking me about how interesting that is. <laughs> he's just sat there in full costume, and he's getting like a big, huge, buff stunt actor with a notepad. It's like, so how do you feel when you put on the mask? And he's like, hot. And he's like, ah, oh, yes. Like, and you channel that into like the rage that Michael was like, no, I just feel warm because there's no air conditioning. I get it, yeah, Michael Myers hates technology. I get it. It's like, no, I'm just hot. Oh, I love it. And it's like, the fact that actors treat you like Shakespeare and it couldn't be further than the truth really amuses me. Far away, Nisha, you mentioned at the start of this video you're um, a big fan of Freddy Krueger, yes? Well, I wouldn't say I was a big fan. I just find the character really creepy. The concept of killing victims in their dreams was quite yeah. an interesting one. It's a super interesting concept. And um, horror movie, like slasher villains, they're defined by their weapon. And like the, the, the triumph fate, like is uh, Michael Myers with his big butcher's knife. Freddy Krueger with his, like, his claws, his, his, his hand claws. I don't even know what the name for that is. It's so, such a strange specific weapon, isn't it? And then you have uh, Jason Voorhees with his machete. And something I really quite like about the 2018 movie uh, with Michael Myers in it is that um, throughout that movie, he picks up a variety of weapons. Like, I think he kills with like a hammer. And then at one point he like just with his bare hands, but then he finds a kitchen knife. And there's just a moment where he's in a kitchen and he looks around, he puts down the hammer to pick up the knife. And 
And that happens in a couple of movies with Jason Voorhees as well, uh, where he gets the machete. He's already super strong and can kill people with his bare hands. He doesn't really need the machete. I don't know if it's used in a lot of horror films now because I don't watch horrors as often, but I find in the slasher films they use the point of view shots of the killer, like they do in Friday the 13th. Yeah, the view from the mask. Yeah, I thought that camera angle was quite interesting and you see it in child's play as well. Where you get like Chucky view, where it's like at the knees, knee height. Chucky is like, he's one of those forgotten slasher icons because the concept is interesting. It's a serial killer transplants his soul into a doll, but his weapon is a knife. And yeah, there's, already, a knife. there's already a villain with a knife, and that's Michael Myers. And there's so many forgotten slasher villains uh, from the 80s uh, where they tried to like, oh, give them an interesting weapon. It just never worked because they just didn't have uh, like the striking a silhouette as say Jason Voorhees, like, because that hockey mask is just so iconic now. According to director Wes Craven, the enduring success of Freddy Krueger as a slasher icon can be directly attributed to his custom-made stab glove, a piece of stabophernalia that Craven has admitted was inspired by, of all things, a small cat. I like how it's specifically a small cat. Yeah, I believe the story as told by Craven is it's like he got a new pet cat and just watched it like absolutely just tear his couch all the way the fuck up and stared at it and went, that'd be terrifying if it was bigger. And cats are very dangerous, and for anyone out there thinking, no, they're not. Like, yes, they are. And I think a tweet that sums it up, the author of which um, I've sadly forgotten, so hopefully um, if the editor of this piece can track it down, there'll be a, a little fat bar below just like go giving credit where credit's due, just saying the reason cats are so angry all the time is because they're nature's perfect killing machine, but they weigh like five pounds. When you say like they're dangerous and they're like killing machines, I really want to put, put or me or whoever edits this, put mm -hmm. in a picture of uh, my, one of my cats who's so cute. She looks so like, so harmless. <laughs> like, she wouldn't with hurt the a caption, fly. With the caption, nature's perfect killing machine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in specific regards to Freddy Krueger, um, he was inspired by you know, the witnessing of the couch fuck up by the cat. Um, to just transplant the idea of like you know a giant cat's claw onto like you know the human hand, um, which I'm only mentioning so we can put in like you know a clip from Thundercats of just like you know, the fucking claw gauntlet thing that Lion O has because <laughs> that thing's so dumb. Lion O, Lord of the Thundercats, claw shield with array of defensive properties. Freddy Krueger was very well known for his stabby glove. Yeah, like that glove is like, you know, one of the most iconic aspects of the character. It's one of the most iconic things from the genre of like slasher movies as a whole. And Wes Craven was keenly aware that for Freddy Krueger to be memorable, he had to have a weapon that people would immediately recognize. Um, and he pointed to the success of characters like Leatherface, Michael Myers, and Jason Voorhees, all of whom, um, like, you know, had an iconic weapon with which they were associated, like, you know, Leatherface's chainsaw, Michael Myers' butcher knife, and Jason Voorhees' machete. So obviously Craven was aware of these iconic weapons yes. that all these slasher villains had, and then there was the cat incident, so how did the stabby glove come about? Well, um, uh, when Craven was thinking of the weapon that Freddy Krueger could wield, he thought back to that moment, you know, when he saw his cat, like, fucking up his couch, thought about, like, you know, man's primal fear, and like thought, you know, the, the claw of the saber-toothed cat. And then thought about translating it to the human hand. And he thought to himself, how would I do that? And um, I believe the uh, prompt he sent to the prop master for the first um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie was a glove with steak knives on it. Oof. And that's what the guy made. And it fucking worked because it is terrifying. It is a horrifying weapon. Like you see it and it's like, I do not want to be touched by that. That looks awful. Yeah, imagine being slapped in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's I me. Mean, that would be like the most just insulting of backhands to be delivered by Freddy Krueger. And for the longest time, I always thought like Freddy Krueger had like the weakest weapon of like, you know, the iconic slasher villains from his era. Because like, even like the butcher knife, like, you know, when wielded by Michael Myers, he's scared because of how like, you know, inhumanly strong Michael Myers is. Like when he stabs someone, I think there's a scene in the first movie like where he pins them to a wall with how hard he stabs them. And then you have this, like, you know, Leatherface has got a chainsaw, because that's a chainsaw. And then Jason Voorhees has a massive fuck off machete. I always like, the glove just, it looks so, so tame in comparison. It looks so frail. 
And my opinion on that changed when I watched X-Men 2, and you have the fight between Wolverine and Lady Deathstrike, who essentially has Freddy Krueger gloves on both hands inside her body. And you just have that bit where she has, like, um, Wolverine by the throat, and he's just stabbing him, like, through the chest with her glove, like, over and over and over again. It's like, oh, God, that's awful. That's so scary. <laughs> I've not watched a Nightmare on Elm Street movie in a while, but if I recall correctly, I, Kruger doesn't often use his glove to kill. He uses it more for intimidation than uses like no his powers to kill. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's like, but then I watched like that X Men Two fight scene, like, oh fuck, yeah, that thing would be terrifying. Like, if someone just came at you with that thing, you'd be scared. And that's one of the reasons why Craven was so focused on getting the glove exactly right. And I believe like early versions of it um, had slightly smaller knives, I think fish knives or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or utility knives, maybe, like Joe, um, uh, ones that had um, uh, ridges on them. Yeah. That you'd use like that, and he went, no, that's not scary enough. Like, you need like clean, a clean cutting edge. You need that like simple silhouette of just like, the, the clawed, gloved hand. Like, you know, reminiscent of a giant wild animal. Because that's essentially what Kruger is. He's like, you know, he's a predator. Mm -hmm. like, a dream predator, if you will. So, like, you know, you, you don't want to mess with that. And like, he wanted to lean into that imagery. And it works, because that thing, as like mentioned, is like the most iconic aspect of Freddy Krueger, with the possible exception of, like, you know, the hat and the sweater when worn in combination. So I just remember, like, someone I know went as Freddy Krueger um, for a Halloween party, <laughs> and then they had the plastic version of that. The, <laughs> it was so the funny. big plastic glove, <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, like, you know, it's like, it doesn't look scary when you just see a dude stood there doing it, and you have to give props to Robert England's performance as Freddy Krueger for making the character so scary. <laughs> you know, he played the character in like almost every fucking sequel. I think the only one he didn't is like in the reboot where they got um, Jackie O'Haley, I believe the guy who played Rorschach in the Watchmen movie, to play him instead. Yeah. And you know, he did a good performance, but he's, he's just not Robert England. Um, you know, to end on, because it's just a funny story I um, stumbled across while researching this article. Um, the character of Freddy Krueger, as Wes Craven anticipated, was very, very popular, in part thanks to that glove. And the glove is actually seen as such an important part of the character that, according to Robert England, um, when he was at an event to promote one of the many sequels to Nightmare on Elm Street, um, they had him pose with a couple of scantily clad ladies, and those scantily clad ladies, uh, really liked spending time with Freddy Krueger and invited Robert England to join them in their hotel room. The only caveat being that he had to keep the costume on and wear the glove. <laughs> oh no. I didn't need to tell anyone that, but I had that image in my head when I was writing this article and now you've got it too. <laughs> 